All right, well, good morning, everyone. Welcome back for our second session. And um, as we're looking at the theme of our conference, which is navigating a fractured world, I think uh, the World Affairs Council of America and our agenda has been a, done a tremendous job at sort of pinpointing those fracture lines, right? We just talked about Iran. We're gonna be talking about Taiwan, Myanmar, and of course, Ukraine. But the United States is not alone in navigating this fractured world. And this is why this mini keynote on the transatlantic relations and democracy is so central to our conversation. And so to address this topic, it is really my great privilege to introduce Mr. Sandro Gossi, who is a member of the European Parliament and currently the Secretary General of the European Democratic Party. So you have his bio on the program. What I really just wanted to highlight uh, for all of you is his commitment to the European project. Uh, Mr. Gossi received degrees from universities in Bologna, his native Italy, but also in Paris and in Brussels. As a professor, he has taught at universities across Europe, including the Collège d'Europe in Bruges. Uh, as a diplomat, the entire focus of his career has been on European affairs, including serving at the European Commission as advisor to then President Romano Prodi. And as a politician, he uh, is an Italian politician who is currently representing France, uh, at the European Parliament. So with those incredible European uh, credentials, we really look forward to your views uh, on um, the US-EU relation and the central importance of democracy in this conversation. I should just note that Mr. Gossi will address us for about 15 minutes, and then he will open up and gracefully take your questions. We have a number of students in the audience, and I would really, really encourage the students to stand up, come to the microphone, and ask your questions. So, very much looking forward to it. Mr. Gussie, welcome to the podium. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, good morning to you all. I'm really very, very happy to share some thoughts with you, and uh, of course, I will be also very happy to answer to your, to your question. And I think that uh, it is important also that I share with you how we see the world from the other side of the Atlantic and how also we see democracy and the challenges to democracy on the other side of the Atlantic. Um, I, I will start with a, with a quote which I think, unfortunately, I think is very updated today. Democracy is threatened by the inertia of the good people, by the selfine, selfishness, selfishness of most people, and by the evil designs of a few people. And I think that this famous quote by King it, is, uh, it holds true, not only for democracy, but also for the challenge that you are, we have to ensure a new global order or to fight against the current global disorder. And this is certainly common on the two sides side of, the, of the channel. I will talk to you also from our perspective, which is deliberately a political perspective. I'm the Secretary General, as it has been recorded, of the European Democratic Party. We are one of the pillars with our allies, the Liberals, of a new political movement in Europe, which is called Renew Europe. The political leader of this uh, uh, is Emmanuel Macron. What is best ally is our president, uh, uh, François Bayrou. And we are, and I will say without any, I, I run the risk to, to be pretentious, but I, don't, it, I hope it doesn't sound pretentious. I'm really reshaping Europe. Uh, Re Renew Europe is reshaping the, uh, face of European politics. We are challenging the old cleavages. We are challenging the geopole between the socialists and the conservatives. We managed to uh, become the third force in the European Parliament, and we are one third of the European Council. You know, the European Council, we are the leaders. The head of state and government are representative. One third belongs to our family. So, I mean, in few years, in three years, we have challenged uh, with uh, positive results, the, the duopole between socialists uh, and, and conservative. We have uh, set the agenda, uh, Green Deal, the uh, rule of law as a fundamental issue, uh, the uh, building up, reforming Europe, and building up a new dimension of a transnational dimension of political democracy in this continent that we are unifying, we are unifying politically are the three main priorities that, are, are, that, that today are on the agenda. But of course, of course, uh, uh, we cannot take anything for granted. And this is the first message after my short introduction that I would like to transmit to you. Certainly, as a strong uh, 
and historical partners, you and us, we cannot take for granted neither democracy nor rule of law. Democracy and rule of law today are uh, at risk, and uh, they are at risk not only in far countries from Washington or Brussels, but they are at risk also within our societies, within our member states, within our traditional and democratically elected political forces. And I think that this is the first, uh, the first challenge that we have uh, to face. I won't dwell, of course, on uh, internal politics of the uh, United States, but I will dwell uh, about internal politics of the European Union. And there we got uh, fundamental challenges uh, uh, to democracy and rule of law, because we have uh, democratically elected governments which are uh, taking illiberal stances. And this is the first fight that we are carrying out within the Union. What do you mean by liberal stances? That the, the idea that when you win the elections, you can do whatever you want. As I got the majority, I can deny fundamental, free, uh, fundamental freedoms, I can deny uh, right of women, I can deny right of LGBTIQ, I can modify the Constitution as I wish, uh, and uh, I can restrict the margin for maneuver of, of the positions. This is, I'm not talking about uh, the, uh, the 30 years of the last century in Europe. I'm talking about what is happening today in countries like Hungary, like Poland, and I hope it won't happen, but it's also an open question now in a country which I know very well, which is Italy, seeing the victory of the post-fascist movement of uh, Giorgia Meloni, Fratelli d'Italia, brother uh, of Italy, in 25th of uh, uh, September. So this is a problem. This is a problem because we need uh, to be more united because we, we got uh, new uh, vital uh, existential challenges. And the, for, for this is the, the second problem. This is the second issue. Because we in Europe, we are trying to sh reshaping, shaping a new form of democracy at transnational level. But we have also open conflict within Europe on issues like, such as democracy and rule of law with some member states. And not having said this, we are proving a strong unity. Yeah, we had some problem with Hungary on sanction against Ukraine, but we are proving a strong unity uh, on the issue of the conflict of the Russian aggression to, to Ukraine. Uh, notwithstanding these difficulties, notwithstanding these uh, open debates and sometimes legal conflict within the European Union, see the 24th, the, United, the European Union today on the key issues that unites us is much more united than it used to be before the 24th of February. And what we have done, we are not one state, we are 27 member states united in a union which needs to be strengthened. What we have done since the 24th of February, it, it was unthinkable one year ago. If you had asked me one year ago, the EU will, you, will use the budget of the EU to finance the arms to Ukraine, I say, very difficult. If you tell me uh, one, uh, one, uh, one, uh, one, uh, one year ago, in a few weeks, it can, could have been in a few e days, if it hadn't been for the blackmail of Viktor Orban, the Hungarian prime minister, but in a few weeks, uh, will you manage to adopt uh, a six, six set of sanctions against uh, Russia? I would say, woo, you are very optimistic. And we've done it. And we've done it, and I, I was, uh, with my colleagues, uh, Laurence Parang and Sylvie Bournet, my two colleagues, a uh, member of the European Parliament and part of, of our delegation here today. We were at the United Nations. United Nations, we have never been, the, Euro the, the Europeans have never been so united. So everything is good, no. Many problems for us, for you and for us together. Because uh, if you look, I don't think that, I mean, I think that United Nations is a very useful forum. I, of course, I'm not that naive to think that the solution of the Ukrainian conflict will come from the United Nations for obvious reasons, but we need to take it like a poll, like a diplomatic poll, like a political poll. And the political poll says that we Europeans are more united, that us, you American and us European, we are more united. I say that we are increasingly, I don't say isolated, but increasingly a good part of the world is not exactly following our priority, our stances. I got a long experience in relation with India, and uh, I had uh, to talk 
a plan with the Indian ambassador in Brussels to explain that the Ukrainian conflict is not a regional conflict. It's not a European conflict. It's a conflict with putting at risk all the fundamental principles of the international order since 1945. And India is a big power, growing power, but there are many other countries in Asia and in Africa which accuse us, American, Europeans, to uh, play a double standard. You don't care about our wars, but when it's serious, every day you would like to move ahead with the resolution initiative of peace. Yeah. So, I mean, <laughs> what I want to say is that, I was saying in my introduction, democracy uh, uh, is not, uh, uh, cannot be taken for granted. Not even, not even the principles of the international order can be taken for granted. And we have to, to do a big effort together. A European and Americans to uh, reach out to country in Asia, reach out to a country, to country in Africa, uh, to build up also a coalition of values and of principles around what is happening in uh, Ukraine and uh, and and Russia. The third point is uh, China. I think I, I was I always been uh, very critical of the attitude, mainly led. Uh, uh, by the previous German, gov German government. I told you that I'm not yet a diplomat as a politician, so I can be outspoken. Uh, talking about China as, yeah, systemic rival, potential competitor, but strategic partner. I never thought that China, this China today, can be a strategic partner. And I think that uh, uh, China today is the most dangerous actor, potentially dangerous actor for us, more than Russia. This is why, so what is to do? We should, we, uh, should we open a conflict with China? Well, we have already many uh, ongoing conflicts with China. I don't say this. I say that we have to be very strategic in our approach to China. Certainly, in Europe, we have been some mistakes, and um, I just say, I just recall some, some, but I don't think. It's actually the reality say that there are two superpowers today, which is you and the Chinese, but to lo go along the logics of, the, of, a, of a G2 approach toward this order, I don't think it is in your interest, and certainly it is not in our interest. I think that uh, on the approach to China, we have to work much more together, European and Americans, of course, we as European, and it will be my last point. I had many things to tell you, but I think that my time is running, is running over. Certainly, we have to deal with one key uh, world, and which is a key issue for us Europeans, which is our relations to power, to hard power, not to soft power. Europe is a project which was built as an antidote to the use of nationalist forces within the continent among European states. Europe was meant, was conceived to prevent the use of nationalist forces between Germany and France, between Italy and Austria, that, uh, that, that nationalist forces which brought us to two world wars. This is why Europe was meant, so an antidote to the use of power. Today, in this new world, in this new global disorder, faced with the new global Challenges, we need to become a power as such. We need to build up a European power. We need to build up a, some form of European sovereignty. We need to become not only a value power, but a military power, a digital power, an industrial power, an energy power. And then again, I mean, I, I haven't touched, I couldn't, uh, the issue of energy, but it's certainly an open question, also in our relationship. Huh? also in our relations. And I would be happy to, to take some questions on this. So today, this is the challenge. These are the historical and political challenges of us Europeans. We need to build up a form of uh, new sovereignty at supranational level to pull our forces and to become an effective power, uh, a credible partner for you on key fundamental issues, which are military, digital, uh, energy, and of course, the challenge of climate change. So, I mean, these are, these are a uh, few thoughts that I wanted 
I wanted to, uh, to, sh to share with you, knowing that uh, the fundamental bond for us, mo uh, even more than power, is democracy, and uh, knowing also, and it will be my last word, that each generation must win democracy for itself. I think that this is our common challenge today. Thank you very much. Yes. Just a quick question. You outlined the sovereignty, a powerful military sovereignty for Europe. Would you see that sovereign power being able to stop something like Russia's invasion of Ukraine? And just quickly, what is the cyber threat that you see uh, you know, looming for the world, and is Europe facing up to that challenge? Okay. Say a few questions, and then I answer. Hmm? What? Ah, okay. Hello, uh, my name is Saria Dodi, and I'm here with the Naples Council on World Affairs as one of the student scholars for WACA 2022. And I had a question kind of regarding, you mentioned how sanctions could be a possible you know, option for Russia and kind of quelling that conflict. And recently we've seen that the Security Council has, for example, withheld COVID-19 relief money in Hungary um, in response to their harsh immigration laws. So my question is, um, in response to this kind of democratic backsliding that we're seeing in Europe, how can sanctions, whether voluntary, mandatory, or indirect, be effective with the participation of more European democratic ideals and the Security Council? Okay. Nancy Williams from Rochester, New York. I'm curious what you think the impact of the UK leaving the European Union will have on the EU's power that you are describing that it needs to have. Hello, my name is Tulsi Mohani. I'm here with the Dallas-Fort Worth World Affairs Council. I'm also another one of the student scholars. Uh, I want to ask you about, as you were talking earlier about talking with the ambassador for, of India, about how the European Parliament talks to international powers, specifically in South Asia and that region of the world as opposed to the West, and coming together for issues such as gender equity or even technological advances within the European Parliament. Grazie per parlare con noi oggi. Um, which way do you see Europe going? Uh, right now it seems, I, I personally I'd like to see Europe unite, but it seems to be going the opposite direction. Giorgia Maloney, for example, for example. I mean, she's going, the, the, and that's happening all over Europe. Uh, do you think Europe's going further apart with the rise of, you know, nationalistic parties, right-wing parties? Do you think it's coming back together? Thank you. Yeah. Hi, my name is Rohan Thompson. I'm also one of the student scholars. I'm with the Tennessee World Affairs Council. Uh, I had the privilege of studying abroad uh, in France uh, this summer, and I got the chance to go see the European Parliament uh, in person. Uh, one of the most uh, notable uh, characteristics about it was the empty space where the British used to occupy. Uh, I, if I remember correctly, the European Parliament went from 751 seats to 705 uh, post-Brexit. Uh, we see that populism as a whole is not a characteristic of Britain, but a characteristic of much of the developed world. Um, so in your opinion, does the European Parliament have more to benefit from promoting uh, transnational cooperation or actively discouraging uh, single country nationalism? Thank you. So as you've mentioned, Renew Europe has become the third largest party in the parliament. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> uh, but as, as uh, Le, Le Republique En Marche and Macron have gotten more involved, um, no longer are they Aldi, the alliance of liberals and Democrats in Europe, but Renew Europe. And I'm curious if you think that appealing to more people that don't identify as liberal but agree with the values that you espouse has helped broaden the party and help achieve that larger majority in the parliament. Yeah. Would you like to answer those questions, or should we should we <laughs> keep coming? Uh, I, did, I didn't know that I had three hours, but I mean, <laughs> he's, he's got ten minutes. Uh, please, please, no, no, okay, please, thank you very right. much. I, I was just. I thought I had <laughs> ten minutes, but obviously you changed the program. Please. I was very glad to hear you talk about. Uh, democracy and our responsibility um, and, and to not take it for granted, but I feel we often do, and that we're in a, a, a global market of ideas and that liberal democracy and free market economics um, I is an idea that we're taking for granted and maybe not um, uh, throughout the world, um, as you say, um, you know, 
re really educating and, and putting forward these ideas in competition with national, nationalistic ideas or other ideas. Can you tell us what, what is the European Union doing uh, in order to compete in the global market of values and ideas? Yeah. Uh, bonjour. Um, bonjour. I'm Max Garcia. I'm from World Oregon here w as one of the student scholars. And I was just kind of wondering, for the first time in my life, I've frankly seen as a United States citizen the EU falter in a lot of ways. The EU? The EU falter, whether that be through Brexit or the current, the weakening of the euro, um, partly due to Russia's war in Ukraine, obviously. Um, I just wanted to ask you, how do you think the European Union going forward can strengthen itself? Is that through bringing in new member states or is that through, uh, as some of my fellow students were asking, uh, reinforcing ideals of cooperation rather than uh, distrusting nationalism? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for all your inter very interesting question. I, I was joking, I could really uh, uh, talk to you for three hours, but I, I will try to concentrate in, in a, in a, in a, in a few, few minutes. But well, I mean, the, the, the issue of, of uh, democracy uh, is certainly a, a fundamental challenge for us because after all, uh, Europe, for the historical reasons that I was, t I was telling about, is mainly a union of values. Uh, mainly, I mean, after all, the first uh, enlargement, uh, the enlargement of the European Union happened when uh, dictatorship turned into democracy in the European uh, continent. This is our history. I mean, this is why Greece could join the European Union after the colonial regime fall. This is why Spain and Portugal joined the European Union when, uh, I mean, they became uh, a republic. Uh, republic, I mean, the Kingdom of Spain and the Republic of Portugal, but they became democracies uh, after that Salazar and Franco left, and this is why we uh, welcomed the Eastern uh, countries after the fall of uh, the communist dictatorship. So, I mean, it is clear that for us, uh, the issue of democracy is a fundamental issue domestically and internationally. But, I mean, this is uh, an additional reason why we are so concerned and we are fighting hard to preserve the respect of rule of law in within the European Union. And it is uh, a, with pride that I mean, I recall that the new mechanism, what we call conditionality, which may basically is a very simple, uh, simple mechanism. I mean, if you want the EU money, you have to respect the EU values. If you don't respect the EU values, you won't get the EU money. And this is uh, our answer, and it was an initiative of Renew Europe. I've been fighting for that since 2014. This was a priority of the Italian press since 2014, but today, thanks to the uh, new force, which is Renew Europe, the alliance uh, among us and the liberals, this mechanism is a reality. And this is why, and this is why uh, the Hungarian government now is adopting laws uh, to modify and to ensure the independence of the judges, independence of, of, the, of the judiciary system. Then, for us, a law is not enough. For us, in, uh, it's implementation is what matters. But you understand that without this mechanism, without this what we call conditionality mechanism, I mean, we would never got this, this influence over what is happening within member states of the European Union. And why is this important for us? Because uh, we need uh, also for our international influence, international action. This is one, one, one of our cases. The best way to enhance democracy in other countries is to demonstrate that your system is, wor is worth of emulation. And this is something that, I mean, applies uh, to both, I think, to the US and to the EU. And this is why for us it's so important to fight for the protection of rule of law within the European Union because we want to be credible when we, we put in our international agreement the human rights clause. Uh, and when we say to our international partners, we are ready to help you to develop, we are ready to help you to uh, get out of the current crisis, we are ready to help you to, uh, to accompany uh, you in the green transition to fight against climate change, but we want you to respect fundamental rights, human rights. I mean, you are credible if you, <laughs> you are the first to ensure that respect of fundamental rights within your country or in our, in our uh, case, uh, within uh, our, uh, our union. So I think that um, like that, I answer to, um, to a, a couple of questions on democracy, which of course cannot be taken for granted. And this is why we are adopting this new mechanism. Brexit. Brexit is uh, uh, when I, I was in government and I worked a lot with David Cameron and with the chief of staff at the time, Edward Lee Ellen, which is now the British ambassador to Paris. 
I was, we did, we did everything that our British friend asked us uh, to avoid, to well prepare the referendum and to avoid Brexit. And at the time I was uh, convinced that it would have been a lose-lose situation. Uh, today I think that uh, it is a big loss for Britain, much more than for us. I don't say that it's not a loss for us, but much more for, for our British friends. I think they have made a fundamental historical mistake I think that we take, it will take them a generation to fully realize this. And I think that there will come a, a, a day where the UK will uh, ask to come back and to join again the European Union. This is uh, absolutely my conviction. In the meantime, damage limitation, because the national, national stances, and sometimes the nationalist stances of our British friends do not help, and we are concerned that such a great democracy and a great country like Britain is today putting at risk one fundamental principle of international relations, which is pacta sunt servanda. When you sign an agreement, you respect the agreement. And uh, when you talk about Ireland and the UK and the Irish Protocol, you see that, I mean, we got to the impression that there isn't a strong will uh, in, uh, in, in London to fully respect that agreement because, I mean, you don't raise the question of modifying agreement before, to, before implementing it after such a long negotiation. So this is a matter of concern. Why? Because from the values point of view, from the security point of view, for Ukraine, for China, for Russia, UK is a fundamental partner. And this is why, by the way, under the initiative of, of Emmanuel Macron, uh, it was launched this new concept, new idea of uh, European political community. There was a first meeting in Prague where there were basically all the leaders of the European continent at, at large, of course, without Belarus and, of course, be, be without Russia. But what is the uh, idea behind this initiative of European political community? Is to gather all the key uh, European partners around some form of common project and to gather all the European countries from uh, London to Ankara from UK to Turkey, including Albania, Armenia, including, including our Mediterranean partners, to be fully aware, and this is also important for the, the, the Americans, I'm sure, that we are living an historical moment similar to the moment of Helsinki 1976 or to the moment of Berlin 1989. I mean, we are living fundamental historical changes in Europe and in the world. And we need to provide a political, strategic, diplomatic answer, which it is uh, at, the, at the level of the challenge. This is why, uh, I mean, it was, this project was launched, and this is why we were very happy. Now, I mean, they, uh, our British friends, I mean, they, could, uh, they could follow many examples and they could be inspired on many things by Italians. But they shouldn't be inspired by the, the, the speed with which we change government. <laughs> and unfortunately, unfortunately uh, they, are, they have changed government. So, I mean, this truth is not there, but we were very pleased that uh, uh, this truth, I'm sure also the current prime minister, will confirm the participation of UK to this European political community because we are perfectly aware that we must strengthen our relation, our friendship. This is why I think it's a big loss uh, uh, to uh, Brexit. But uh, and it is a, it is also it is also a, a big loss uh, to take the other question to uh, for our strategy in the Asian, South Asia, and the Indo-Pacific region. It was a question from this side. There again, I mean, there again, we are uh, finally starting to think of us uh, not only as a regional actor, but also as a geopolitical actor at global level. When you go, uh, when you, when you go for, I say, I say we were at the UN, when you are at the UN, many, many countries see us like a big NGO, see the European Union like a big NGO, providing money, development, but not playing a geopolitical role. And I think that in the Indo-Pacific region, we must play a role. We must play a role, we must elaborate a common strategy. We must intensify our cooperation with the US, with UK, this is why I, I, I jump from Brexit to the Indo-Pacific region. 
uh, and uh, with other, with other, with other countries. So I mean, there again, we are uh, becoming more aware of our duties and of our responsibilities, but let me say also of our interest as European on the global, on the global, uh, global scale. Uh, it, is, it, is, it is clear that uh, there is uh, an open issue and there is also a political fight going on uh, within the European countries and among, unfortunately, sometimes European countries, which is the issue of uh, uh, nationalism and populism. Um, which, is, which is still there. There were some uh, very optimistic observers and colleagues which saw, th which saw that uh, uh, the nationalist wave and the populist wave, wave uh, in Europe was over. And in fact, we have seen that, I mean, uh, uh, in, uh, in Italy we have uh, an extreme right uh, government uh, which, is in, which is in power because it's, it's, it's extreme right. Not center right. There is nothing of center. Very few of right. Very little of right. And it seems right because 90% of the Italian majority is composed by Fratelli uh, Italian Brothers and Lega of Matteo Salvini, which are two leaders of the extreme right in Europe. And uh, Forza Italia Berlusconi is uh, more and more uh, is a, a junior party. What they will do? What I mean, will they implement? their idea, will, Bezi, will, will Giorgia Meloni be consistent? The strength of Giorgia Meloni has, so far has always been to be consistent. For me, she has been always on the wrong side, but she was consistently on the wrong side, okay? <laughs> so, I mean, <laughs> and the Italians appreciate the fact that, after all, she's consistent. She, she, she never joined the uh, national unity, uh, unity unit government. She was in the opposition of the government of Matteo Renzi, for, of which I was, uh, I was a Europe minister, of G Gentiloni, where I was uh, also a member. She was against also the, uh, the government of the Five Star Movement and the Lega. She was against Mario Draghi. So she has been consistently uh, um, on the opposition. And she has uh, we won the election saying that we have to, to, to do another, an, another block, an, another blockade in the Mediterranean to push back the to push back the migrants, that we have to transform Europe into a confederation where, where every country has uh, the right of veto on everything, uh, that uh, after all uh, the supranational power of the European institution is uh, an attempt to national sovereignty, that the European Union shouldn't deal with the rule of law because this belongs to the national competence of the constitutional competence, and like that you, you, are, you can uh, imagine that in today's politics she has found a part of the public very sensitive to this argument. Will she implement this or not? This is the point. Will she be consistent? I hope, she's, she, I hope she will become inconsistent for once. I hope that she won't try to push for the implementation of this program. And from our side, I mean, I, I, it was recalled, I, uh, I, we are renew our leaders, Emmanuel Macron. Emmanuel Macron paid a visit in Rome, was the first leader to go to see her. He, I mean, uh, he uh, gave very positive messages. The answer of Meloni one week after was to open the migrant crisis in the Mediterranean. So I am, I am concerned. I am concerned because, I mean, I, I was hoping and still hope that uh, she will have, at least on the European scene, at least on the international scene, a pragmatic approach. At least to have a double discourse, as many nationalist, uh, nationalistic leaders do. I mean, being pragmatic and cooperative uh, at a certain degree on the international European scene and carrying out a nationalist discourse uh, uh, in the weekend, with the, which is not ideal, of course, but it is, I mean, we could, could, we, we could live with that. It is not an open question. It is clear that if uh, she continues in open conflict with the best ally of Italy, which is France, uh, chaired by Emmanuel Macron, we will have problems in Rome, in Paris, and in Brussels, like we had uh, on the migrant crisis. If she will understand that it is in the national interest of Italy to be at the center of the European scene and to have the right allies, which, are, which is not uh, Victor Orban, but more Emmanuel Macron, I think that uh, also with the Italy uh, led by Giorgia Meloni, we can advance uh, on, certain, on certain issues. This is uh, an open question, qui uh, vivra verra. Um, then uh, the last, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the last to the last two, uh, uh, two questions were uh, the issue of sanctions and uh, 
the choice, uh, and uh, I, I, it's, it's over, I know, the choice between, <laughs> between uh, enlarging and uh, deepening. I mean, uh, sanctions uh, sanction are necessary to be credible. If you want to protect rule of law within union and you don't, don't know the possibility of sanction someone, you're not credible. If you want to help the Ukrainian uh, uh, people and you don't have uh, the guts to sanction Russia, you are not credible. So I think that it's an issue of credibility and I think that notwithstanding what the national state, what Marine Le Pen, Matteo Salvini, the extreme right in uh, uh, Europe say, I think that our sanctions against Russia are being effective and uh, are certainly a very important instrument in our fight against Putin. The issue of uh, shall we deepen the uh, European integration or shall we uh, enlarge, it is a never ending story, it has always been there. And my answer that we have to do both, but we have to seriously do both, not only seriously enlarging and pretending to deepen and reform. Thank you very much for your time. to go and I don't think it's the end of this conversation and on behalf of all of my colleagues uh, here at our national network I would like to thank Mr. Grossi for making the time in a very packed agenda during his visit to the United States to make the 30 minutes to come talk to us. Best wishes to you in your discussions uh, here in the United States uh, to you and to your colleagues and I hope what you take away from this conversation is that yes Americans are geopolitically concerned about China and Russia but I hope you could tell from the questions we asked that we care about the Euro about Europe. And we care about US. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and a quick logistical point, we have a quick turnaround.